The barbarians are at the gates, folks, and we created them. And no, I'm not talking about Hamas or other terrorist groups like it or any relationship to blowback from the actions of our government and its allies. Far from it, actually. What I'm talking about is our kids here in America and around the first world. The kids who've terrorized speakers on college campuses and HR departments and Fortune 100 companies. The kids who scream and cry and throw temper tantrums on TikTok over trivial encounters with ideas they dislike. The kids who believe speech is violence and also silence is violence. Who took to the streets to burn our cities after the tragic murder of one man, yet come out in explicit support of the mass murder of more than 1,400 innocent civilians in Israel. So. Why do I call them kids? We used to call people over the age of 18 young adults and would drop the young once they got into their 20s. But look at them. Look at the behavior we see on a mass scale. I call these people kids and children because that's what they are. Because they're our kids. But they're also barbarians. And it's our fault. Because we've not only failed to raise adults, we have failed to act like adults ourselves. We've coddled and encouraged a generation of barbarians through both intentional activism, confusion, and just downright neglect. We've allowed our educational institutions from K through PhD to become captured by the enemies of civilization itself and transformed into barbarian incubators. Our media and politics have not only cheered this on, but profiteered from it at every step. And now they are the barbarians inside our gates. If we don't do something about this right now, they will tear this civilization to the ground. And frankly, my greatest fear is that it may already be too late. Look, I'm the father of a high school senior, and our family is looking at all of this with a mix of shock and horror. The stakes for my son and his future are high, but frankly, the stakes for our civilization are so much higher. I know that using the term barbarian, especially against the backdrop of a war in the Middle East, is very loaded. So let me be clear on what I mean here. Since civic scores in this country are even worse than congressional approval ratings, let me recount the origins of this word. Barbarian comes from the Greek word barbaros. I might be mispronouncing that. But regardless, it used to be used to describe basically anyone who didn't speak Greek. The Greeks thought other languages like Arabic and Hebrew and Aramaic sounded like other people mumbling bar, bar, bar. And so, barbaros. This is a pretty gross criticism, right? It sounds a lot like Durka 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 from Team America World Police. Not exactly Socratic discourse. The Romans and the broader Christian Europeans thereafter used the term barbarian in very similar ways. For everyone from the Vikings to the Mongols, colonial powers used it to marginalize the people they conquered. What does all of this history have in common, though? Tribalism, othering, identity politics. The common thread is judging other people on the basis of their superficial group identity. Sound familiar? I'm not going to play coy here. Critical theory, the overarching sort of Marx-inspired philosophy of our elite institutions, is similarly barbaric. And frankly, so are the right-wing reactionaries who reject critical theory's leftism, but embrace its tribalism and victimhood complex for themselves nonetheless. The best use of the word barbarian, and the one I'm using here, is as a description for those who oppose civilization, who are not just uncivilized, but seek to destroy all who are. This is the Enlightenment definition. And here's the thing. It is absolutely uncivilized, and thus barbaric to reduce other people's humanity to their identity or some other inhumane and otherwise Marxist abstraction. The word civilization itself also has its roots in the ancient world, in the Latin word civitas, or city, and civis, or citizen. It was Enlightenment thinkers in France and England who used civilization to describe the noble, peaceful pursuit of truth and human progress. This is civilization best described. To do those things, of course, is to become civilized. That's why having a debate over conflicting points of view is called civil discourse, while screaming like a toddler and threatening people who disagree with you is uncivilized. It's barbaric. Using force and violence to get your way or celebrating it is barbaric. This is the barbarism our kids have been raised and 
educated to embrace. It's become the animating principle of the institutions who claim to exist for the sole purpose of pursuing truth and building up our civilization, our schools, our universities. You walk onto the campus of Harvard, our oldest university, and you see Romanesque architecture, stone columns, grand archways. The school's motto is in Latin, veritas, truth. Show me an elite university and I'll show you an enlightenment motto carved in stone. But this is all an echo of the past, a facade, a Potemkin village. Harvard's motto, and all the rest, if they were being honest, should be Barbaros. Truth be damned, the tribe is king. Harvard's MBA program is renowned for using case studies. So I think it's only fitting that we use Harvard itself as a case study in barbarism. Let's recount a few recent facts so they don't get lost in the fog of war. On October 7th, over 1,400 innocent Israeli civilians were massacred in an orchestrated, planned, and purposeful paramilitary assault by Hamas. They came by land, sea, and air. They went door to door killing and kidnapping innocent men, women, and children. This was an intentional act of terrorism. It was barbaric aggression and the murder of Jews on a scale not seen since the Holocaust. And that night, while the civilized were in shock, while I and others around the world were rushing to WhatsApp to check on friends and relatives in Israel and offer prayers, condolences, and help, over 30 student groups on Harvard's campus released a joint statement by Harvard-Palestine solidarity groups on the situation in Palestine. Among these was the school's affiliate of Amnesty International. The letter, which we'll link to in the notes below, asserted the following, and I quote, We, the undersigned student organizations, hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. The apartheid regime is the only one to blame. So Israel was entirely responsible for all the unfolding violence? The only one to blame? What? Now, These Harvard students were not alone, of course. As we've seen, this kind of celebration and defense of barbaric brutality swept the so-called elite Western world. A Columbia professor called the Hamas attacks awesome, a stunning victory. A Cornell professor called the attack exhilarating. Pro-Palestinian protesters took to the streets, producing the rightfully infamous and again, irony-free queers for Palestine image that's gone viral for obvious reasons. I'll come back to this one because, in a way, it's a Rosetta Stone into the nature of the barbarism we now face. There are plenty of condemnations of these students and professors and their stances out there already. One can absolutely make the case, which I personally completely agree with, that they are barbarians themselves and supporters of barbarism. But here's the thing. In civilized societies, we allow crazy, stupid, and even downright evil things to be said. That is, in fact, a hallmark of civilization and civil discourse. America leads the world in this with our explicit First Amendment protection of free speech and association. Hateful speech is protected speech. Still, and it still should be. Because the only way to discover truth is in an open, full-throated battle of ideas. What unites all of these barbaric ideas together? I think the answer here is actually pretty simple. Our kids are enraptured by a siren song of utopia. Wild-eyed academics and philosophers have always cast grand visions of the perfect society. This mindset goes all the way back to Plato's Republic, a notion of an ideal society ruled by a benevolent, enlightened dictator. It continues with Karl Marx and his dreams of a perfect, stateless, communist world where selfishness and scarcity itself would be defeated, leaving only a poetic socialist man. They animated the progressive eugenicists who believed they could breed a perfect master race. Eugenics was the early 20th century's trust the science moment and had broad support from the majority of elites, from George Bernard Shaw to Margaret Sanger and beyond. Those are some of the worst examples. Yet at its best, utopian visions have also animated many the great artists, inventor, and entrepreneur. We need visions of a better world, even a perfect world. Two really important forces in our society used to provide a counterweight to utopian dreaming, religion and reality. Our best religious traditions warn that utopia is not for this world, but for the next. 
you try to build that Tower of Babylon to the sky, it will fall and crash. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it, the line separating good and evil passes right through every human heart. To be human and to be civilized is to recognize this nature in ourselves so that we can recognize it in others. That is the path to human dignity, and it stands in stark contrast to the good people versus evil people story being pushed on our kids by today's barbaric utopians. If we're all flawed, we all have something to learn from each other, even when we disagree, if we're allowed to disagree. Reality teaches us humility in a very different way, and one that's utterly foreign to so-called educators in academia. You see, trying to actually build or do anything in reality is messy, it's hard. Your most visionary architectural plans must eventually make compromises when the actual hammer and nails come out and you start to build that house. Real life doesn't work the way intricate social theories on a blackboard want it to. People aren't blank slates or chess pieces that you can move on a board at your whim. And working in a real job teaches you that real quick. Reality tempers utopian dreams so that they can be put to good use as motivation. And religion provides a transcendental outlet for those utopian dreams so that they don't collapse into nihilistic barbarism when reality sets in. Our kids today throughout the Western world are profoundly lacking in both reality and religion, which is why they've been seduced by utopia and the barbarism that inevitably follows. We've consumed their time, starting in kindergarten, with an increasingly abstract education. Everything practical and physical has been stripped away in the name of so-called rigorous academics. We've paid little attention to what that education actually involves or how its design is deeply at odds with fostering curiosity. The blackboard and its blank slate is teaching them all the wrong lessons. Our kids no longer get jobs in the summer like they used to, which means they no longer get to learn from reality outside of school either. Work teaches you that the path to success is making other people happy, not merely pursuing your truth, whatever that means. This fact is the moral core of capitalism. If you want to get paid, you first need to create value for someone else. Absent this lesson, is it any wonder the utopian socialism of college professors finds such receptive ears in our kids? Screen time and social media have done a real number on the other source of reality in our kids' lives, their friends and relationships. It's turned their identity itself into a digital, fluid abstraction, a kind of World of Warcraft avatar, and it's wreaking havoc on their mental health all along the way. Participation in organized religion has collapsed, but the desire for a higher purpose remains, and that void has provided a fertile ground for the barbaric utopians to plant their seeds, which are now producing toxic fruit. And of course, here in America, the collapse of fatherhood, which we lead the world in, by the way, has played a central and tragic role in setting up our kids for struggle. Kids suffering from deprivation of dad face greater challenges along every dimension you can measure, from education to incarceration and everything in between. All of this has set our kids up to become seduced by utopia and then disappointed by reality. As we've seen, nihilism and barbarism quickly follow. So what can we do about it? What do we, as parents, do about all of this? I think no matter where you stand in your politics or your personal philosophy, I'm pretty sure you want your kids to succeed in this world. You want them to find purpose, to find happiness. You want them to find a loving partner, and I hope make some grandchildren. Look, I won't pretend to know exactly what you should do for your family. Everyone's circumstances are different. Everyone's kids and relationship are different. So the best I can do is share what Lisa and I have done so far. Our son is 18, he's about to leave the house, and so far so good. We've tried our best to walk the walk and definitely failed plenty of times along the way, but I think it's working out. My son has first and foremost had the tremendous benefit of Lisa deciding to stay home with him in those early years between birth and three, four years old. That's a big decision, and I realize that not everyone can or even wants to make it. But even if you both work, do whatever you can to have as much quality time with your kids as possible and be present when you are together. I certainly prioritize that. It's why I moved my family from New York to Austin to eliminate my long commutes so I could have more time with Mateo and Lisa together. Civilizing kids starts right from the beginning. To that end, Lisa and I made a pact 
to stay on the same page together in disciplining our son with a simple set of rules, which frankly, we learned from watching the old TV show, Supernet. Number one, don't make idle or excessive threats. Number two, always deliver a clear warning on bad behavior before acting on the punishment. And number three, always follow through. This worked for us, and by worked, I mean kept our son from becoming a sociopath. And it seemed to work for every brat in every episode of Supernate. Learning to live with clear, simple rules that you know will be applied fairly is the first step towards living in a civilization. The next thing was that we quickly realized the screen was toxic for him at an early age. So when my son was entering first grade, we actually put him in a Waldorf school, which requires that you pledge as a parent that there will be zero media use in the home ever. We were on the strict side of the Waldorf parenting spectrum. Nobody was perfect. Sometimes you're on a five hour drive, you're gonna pull out the iPad, <laughs> I'm just being honest. The results were pretty remarkable. Our son stayed engaged in imaginative physical play outdoors much longer than most American kids do today. His childhood, frankly, looked much more like Lisa or mine, running around outside with friends, inventing games, coming home with bloody knees from falling out of trees. Being exposed early and often to the messy reality of the physical world is good for our kids' physical and mental health, but it also ingrains a visceral understanding of reality. You don't climb a tree in the abstract. Think about this. You can't write the instructions on a blackboard or test it in a pop quiz. You need to do it for real and it's messy and complicated, and it's different climbing down than climbing up. That's better than any lesson you'll learn in a class and an early inoculation against utopian thinking. Here's the other thing. We would not put our son in a government-run public school or a super expensive and elite private school. And we were quick to pull him from the private school that he was in when it became clear that critical theory was driving their approach and as he went into middle school. I'd sooner, frankly, have him work in a coal mine than subject him to any of those. He'd learn more and, frankly, create a lot more value for other people in society. Speaking of which, our son has actually worked summer jobs since seventh grade, and his school encouraged that, and it was part of the curriculum. It's part of the reason why we picked Acton Academy in the first place. And that first job required him to take the public bus for over an hour each day. Another job for the City Public Works involved seven-hour days in the 100-degree Texas heat. I don't expect him to be posting on TikTok crying about the tyranny of a nine to five or leaving work to pull down a statue of Christopher Columbus anytime soon. Have Lisa and I tried to brainwash our son with our values? Yes, absolutely. That's my job as a parent. And one of those values is engaging in rigorous debate. We've prioritized having dinner together as a family, which frankly is good for its own sake because humans are social eating creatures. And this is a deeply powerful time to socialize with our kids and to teach them what it means to be social. But we've also made it debate time. And I often take on positions I disagree with or challenge him to do the same. Because to paraphrase John Stuart Mill, the person that doesn't understand his opponent's position doesn't really know a damn thing about anything. We pushed him to get a driver's license. We've pushed back hard against the false narratives of environmental apocalypse, driving kids today to experience daily existential anxiety. Instead, we've reinforced the little known but actual facts, which are that the world, for all its problems, has gotten dramatically richer and better, especially for the global poor over the past 30 years alone. In short, we've taken it upon ourselves to ensure that these values and the practical habits necessary to mature have been integral to his life while he's under our roof. We haven't outsourced any of that to school or the culture at large. And Oh yeah, there's no chance in hell I'm paying one nickel to send him to a college possessed by utopian barbarism. Nope, not happening. Our current plan, frankly, is to send him to Italy next year after he graduates high school. He'll still encounter plenty of communists, especially in Tuscany, but the lessons from global travel and the cultural exploration will be the real education that we care about. We want him to open his mind. As parents, this fight for the future of civilization is up to us and us alone. We have to model being civilized for our kids in, frankly, an uncivilized world. We can't vote our way into a civilized world as if the past few election cycles haven't made that obvious to everyone. We can't outsource the protection of civilization either. We need to be civilized and raise civilized adults if we want to have a civilized future. That is how dad and mom together can save America.
If you like this clip, you should check out the full video and all the other great content we've got at Dad Saves America. So be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and ring that bell so you won't miss our new stuff as it drops each week.